We'll hear from James Fee and Denise Ross on how they use that for remapping New Orleans after Katrina. Hi, I'm Denise Ross, and I'm Deputy Director with the Greater New Orleans Community Data Center. And we are a nonprofit neutral data intermediary that's been around since 1997 in New Orleans. And our mission is to democratize data so that data that's typically held behind closed doors by powerful people to make decisions about communities so those communities themselves have access to the same information so they can advocate on their own behalf. Now, before the storm, we had Census 2000 data aggregated into the 73 official neighborhoods for New Orleans. Um, we did that with a website that was about 1,000 static HTML docs generated with cold fusion. Here's an example of some data pages for the Lower Ninth Ward. Our simple approach was very successful. Um, for such a specialized website, we had 5,000 unique visits a month, nearly 60,000 a year. And on the Friday before Katrina, we all put garbage bags over our computers and moved them away from the windows and hoped for the best. And on Saturday morning, we woke up and realized we had to get out of town. This was our staffing configuration when Katrina hit. Um, our GIS person had just moved to San Diego, fortuitously. So the rest of us got out of town. And meanwhile, we watched the weather, and we watched our web statistics. And the number one search term bringing people to our website was New Orleans Neighborhood Elevation Map. And so we made an elevation map that was picked up by, um, by one of the news services and distributed internationally to media across the globe. And we also created a map. Um, we created lots of maps, but this one shows the extreme poverty that many of the neighborhoods were living in. And then on Monday, we woke up, and we thought we had dodged the big one. And then we learned that the levees had failed. And so we knew we wouldn't be going home anytime soon. And we began our moving to more permanent places in exile, and our programmer found a job in California. And, uh, and meanwhile, all of that census data that we had been publishing was rendered instantly historical as our residents moved to all 50 states around the country. And demand for data about what was happening in New Orleans skyrocketed. We got, in the course of a month, we got more than twice the number of visits we typically got in an entire year. And we, um, we had questions from all over the place. Nonprofits needed to know um, how many people were back so they could set up food pantries and community clinics. Uh, we had researchers who were trying to analyze what was happening, federal agencies trying to get their statistics back in order, and, um, and elected officials from City Hall to the White House trying to figure out what to do next. And of course, lots of media. And everyone pretty much wanted to know how many people are back and where are they living. The Census Bureau creates these population estimates um, once a year in between the decennial census, but they weren't good for our situation because there's a nine-month um, time lag, which in our rapidly changing environment wasn't adequate. Um, it's for the whole city, not neighborhoods, and as you know, the um, neighborhoods suffered very differently from one another, and most of all, their methods pretty much fell apart post-disaster. So we reviewed the disaster literature, and. Um, the one data set that really stood out as being viable was postal data. But you can't get postal data from the USPS directly. You have to purchase it. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, so anyways, postal data makes sense because the mailman, he walks the streets, and he talks to people, and he knows who's back, and he writes it down in his little notebook, and he goes back to the post office, and it gets entered into the central database. But you can't purchase or, or um, obtain direct address level data from the post office. You have to buy it from um, one of a, a small group of vendors that are allowed to, to use this data. And so we ended up purchasing ours from Velasquez, which is the largest um, commercial address database in the country. And fortunately, they had, um, had archived July 2005 data for us, so we had a reference number to compare to. And they worked with us to help take this data that's typically used for direct mail advertising and repurpose it for tracking repopulation post-disaster. And, uh, and they allowed us to publish this data in aggregate at the block level in a Google map. And so what we're looking at here is Village de l'Est, which is um, a largely Viet Vietnamese community in New Orleans East. And the whole thing flooded after the storm. And, um, 
And the dense of the dark areas, what you see there, are um, blocks that are highly densely repopulated. The white areas are areas that don't have any households receiving mail in them. Um, and, and, and so what you see there is there's one dark area and a few light areas. And this is where the power of Google imagery really is wonderful, because in the, when you flip to the satellite view, you can see that that highly dense area had, has an apartment complex that's almost completely repopulated now. And then those white areas, that was an apartment complex with the ratty black roofs that didn't reopen. And then we use street view technology so you can get a better sense of, of what, um, what the current conditions look like. And what's notable, um, on, in every block we have the current number of households actively receiving mail over the pre-Katrina number. And this neighborhood, all of those rooftops were underwater, and so it's pretty impressive that almost all of those residents have come back. And um, so that brings me to the, the underlying theme of my talk. And I, know, I hope that none of you end up having to ever track um, your city as it recovers from such an awful disaster. Um, but I do know that a lot of you do go into localities with your maps, and you might, um, you might not necessarily know the folks or have instant credibility with that local population. And so I wanted to share um, some of the things that we've learned about building and maintaining local credibility with a map. And so the first tip is um, to put metadata in plain sight and in plain English. Uh, what we, this, this is really straightforward, but have your legend persistent so that when as people navigate the map, they always know what they're looking at. Um, have a title at the top that describes the map just like you would in a print map, and then um, adequate sourcing below. And because we know our data so well, and we also know our audience really well, we know we know what misconceptions they're going to have about the data. So note that we not only explain what the mail data is, but we also explain what it is not. Like it's, it doesn't have to do with how much mail you receive. It's just whether or not a household is receiving mail. And then, um, and then for those who want to learn more, we have a friendly explanation about this data set with pictures. And then for more expert users, we have technical documentation, probably more than they'd ever want to know about the data set. And we realized that we also had to very visibly display the metadata about the Google imagery because as time goes on, there's a big disconnect between the, the population data that we publish quarterly and that um, March 2006 satellite image that Google has. So when you switch over to satellite view, it automatically says, um, there's a warning that says that the satellite image is three years old. And this is relevant for local credibility because locals will look at this FEMA trailer park and wonder, why it's still in, in the satellite map when everyone knows that it was torn down, last, it was decommissioned last year. And likewise with Street View, um, this lot in the lower ninth ward, when Google's um, Street View cameras came through in August of 2007, it was empty. And then Brad Pitt came through and built some really beautiful houses. So um, the second, my second tip here is to fix errors that matter to locals because they'll be very distracting otherwise. For example, um, the, the Velasquez data that we use is absolutely perfect, but the geocoding database um, does stick, uh, it actually stuck 700 addresses in neutral grounds. Those are the medians in the middle of the road where the streetcar goes. And, and a local knows that, that, um, that there aren't any houses in the, in the streetcar um, lane, and so they'll wonder, they'll spend their cognitive load wondering what's going on with that and not looking at the data that's important. So we moved all 700 addresses that were in the neutral grounds. And lastly, um, we, we improve usability through testing under real world conditions. And, um, and there's not enough time to go into this, but um, we, use, we use sort of a, um, a modified version of usability testing where we go out into the field and we test um, the website with real users on their actual computers using real tasks. Um, in real world conditions. And we know that the real, the real world is very messy and you know, we sort of like to think sometimes that people have a perfect environment where they can um, you know, read the instruction and learn your website, but the fact is <laughs> that's not true, they're distracted. Um, and so it's very humbling for us to, to find out what the problems in our design are and go back and redesign them. And in fact, um, our, uh, our mantra is that there are no stupid users, only stupid designers. So the result is that we have happy users and a somewhat smoother recovery for New Orleans. Um, and here's just a few examples. Um, the Holy Cross neighborhood, when they learned that we had published this mapping system, um, they, were, they were getting ready to host a lot of spring break students to do um, 
to do volunteer work. And they had planned to have these students go out and do this laborious door-to-door -door surveying. And when they realized that this data was being provided by us and the Velasquez data, they deployed those students instead to actually rebuilding houses. And uh, Friends of Palmer Park is a neighborhood association around a park that um, the area flooded pretty badly. And they've been using this data to write grant proposals to um, argue for a playground to go in the park. And of course, the funder wants to make sure there are enough people there so that um, the playground will get used. And this is probably my favorite example because it's such a beautiful, um, a beautiful case of democratizing data. So we've got this, this new hospital that wants to go in in a historic district um, called Lower Mid City. And um, both the community of Lower Mid City and the developers are using this data on households actively receiving mail to understand what the impact of the proposed development are. Now, they still have a lot of differences, but they aren't quibbling about the data. And they can, um, they can discuss more meaningful issues than how many people will be affected by the proposed hospital. And <laughs> And I want to end with this slide as I transition to, to James. And um, what we love about working with James is he didn't come to New Orleans with some cool technology and try to, to sell us on it that it was the cure to all of our problems. Instead, what he did is he listened to what all of our problems were and then helped us navigate this wild field of all the technological solutions. And what we've ended up with is, is a package of technology that we're really happy with for the current day. And it, you know, it's setting up, us up well for when Census 2010 is released. And, um, and I'm feeling pretty good about this hurricane season, too. Well, thanks, Denise. I wonder if I get some t-shirts that say that and hand them out. Um, back when uh, Katrina hit, this is essentially what their web looked like. They had a uh, you know, Windows Server, Cold Fusion, and Arc IMS. And in fact, uh, pretty much by the time Katrina hit, the Cold Fusion had been converted to uh, static HTML and Arc IMS had kind of stopped working. And the reason was is they didn't really have these guys that can sit in that back room and make sure all this data keeps working. Uh, pretty much they have staff who's trying to get data out to the, to the community. So if any time they have to worry about configuring XML on the server to try and get an, a server up and running, uh, they're wasting their time. Uh, so what we did is we tried to move to more open frameworks and open standards, uh, you know, Linux, Django, and Google Maps. But as Denise showed, one of the things when we moved to Google Maps is we wanted to ensure that we had rich cartography, and their workflows already included Arc, or Arc uh, GIS desktop. So what we did is we wanted to go ahead and create tiles right out of uh, Arc GIS Arc Map and push them to Amazon S3 and consume those tiles inside of Google uh, Maps so that they would be a lot more richer than just putting points or lines or polygons. Uh, also, what we wanted to do is convert from their existing static HTML to the dynamic uh, open framework. And we did that so we could have more inline, uh, updatable uh, tables, as opposed to just having static GIFs and uh, HTML tables that users can't really interact with. And you know, this is one of the, uh, the uh, workflows we work with with FME. And it's not really that important, except what we're doing now is in the old times what we do is we'd export to a GIS file. But now at the same time, we're exporting directly to Google Docs, which we're then embedding inside of uh, the open framework so that the data is a little more richer that people can interact with it. Uh, the other thing we're doing is we're caching everything. Uh, because New Orleans, uh, they don't really, they update their data about every quarter. So it isn't really that critical that they get everything out uh, as dynamic web services. So we get everything directly into Amazon and allow just users to go ahead and hit Amazon and not worrying about are these web services up and running, uh, especially if a hurricane hits. Uh, moving forward, the technology stack, I guess, I don't know, there's probably a better word than that, that we're using is, is pretty much this kind of stuff. So we have FME. So we're basically taking the desktop, the rich GIS uh, Esri stuff, reading that into FME, transforming it, and uploading it into the Wii Geo library that resides up in the Amazon cloud. And this gives us the ability to, to check genealogy, to, to keep track of it, make our data discoverable to both internal clients, the users at the data center, and external clients. And then what we're doing is taking the great open uh, RESTful APIs that WeoGeo has and tying it into products such as Salesforce.com. So someone goes to the New Orleans uh, website and says, you know, I want to get some data. They fill out a form that basically takes them into the Salesforce.com. Uh, the New Orleans data center reads this. 
assigns the data for someone to go ahead and create the data. The product gets uploaded into Wio Geo. The Wio Geo APIs tell Salesforce that the data is available. Salesforce fires off the email to the users. User goes ahead and sees the download link, clicks on it, goes to Wio Geo, downloads the data file. Wio Geo tells Salesforce that the data has been downloaded, and then they're happy that someone actually requested data and they got it. Uh, Moving forward, if let's say they requested uh, childcare centers and they updated the uh, childcare centers and they have a new data layer, they upload it to Wio Geo, and then what Wio Geo does is it tells Salesforce that hey, we have a new data set that you've passed out to all these users all over the uh, country. Do you want to go ahead and let them know there's new updated data? So it's been working really well having the the cloud-based services and having the APIs to basically plug in other technology. So what's really been good about this, I. So this, you get, they got open standards that they're working with. Uh, there, are, there are more flexibility than they used to have. Like Salesforce, we're just plugging that in right now into Wio Geo. And they're no longer, you know, I guess, fighting change. They're embracing it. So if something new comes up, they no longer have to worry about, uh, you know, how is this going to work with our ecosystem because, darn it, it's all open. So thank you very much. Um, you know, just come on ahead and find us. And uh, we'd be glad to talk about what we're doing and uh, have a great conference.